So good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Joining us, we're a group of four Central American graduate students at Yale who are working to build an East Coast intellectual community related to Central American studies. The newly founded Central American Studies Working Group at the moment includes myself, Nancy Escalante, Adriana Cerron, Cristian Padilla Romero, and Katy Maldonado Dominguez. We want to establish some community guidelines before we get before we begin. This will be a recorded event, so please turn off your cameras or change your name if you are not comfortable with it showing recording. I'm going to ask everyone except the speakers and hosts to mute their microphones to eliminate background noise, and I will personally be taking questions for the Q&A portion, so please send your questions directly and privately to me throughout the duration of the discussion, and I will moderate the and share the questions during the chat. I'm sorry, in the chat during the Q&A portion. And I will be changing my display name to Q&A so you all know to send those to me. And we hope that this will leave the chat open for a real-time discussion. As Central Americans in the diaspora within the US, we have made it to a place in which a number of us have the opportunity to research and write about our own stories, experiences, and histories. Our goal with this is to build community and intentionally foster a space that centers the voices and experience of Central American diaspora scholars in academia. So please be mindful of this when engaging in discussion and with questions. Today, we'll be sharing some um, sharing space with some amazing people, including Suyapa Portillo and Maritza Cardenas. Unfortunately, Stephen Osuna couldn't be with us today. Before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge the stolen Quinnipiac land on which Yale University stands as well as the indigenous peoples and nations that have historically cared for and maintained the land, which we now call Connecticut, including the Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Skagatoki, Golden Hill, Pugaset, Neantic, and other Algonquian speaking people. It is important for us to recognize the violent history of settler colonialism and the ways it shapes our lives, scholarship, and advocacy. As scholars of migration, children of immigrants, or as migrants ourselves, we must be aware of the multiple and overlapping racial, classed, and gendered hierarchies we are forced to cross and inhabit. To avoid reproducing indigenous erasure, we must understand our positions as displaced subjects on stolen lands. We hope today's discussions will allow us to engage in conversations that explore the complicated positions of Central Americans in the US. So with that, I'm gonna pass it along to Cristian and he will be doing um, some further introductions. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Yeah, my name is Christian, and I'm uh, one of the organizers for this event. We want to thank everyone for being here. Um, I'm going to be introducing, unfortunately, only two of the speakers that were meant to be today. Uh, Stephen Osuna, Professor Stephen Osuna, had uh, faced an emergency last night, um, which is carried over into today. So we're hoping everything's going well for him, but he won't be able to make it today. Um, uh, so he would be missed, of course. Uh, but we we are going to have two. Um, magnificent people today, and I'm gonna be doing the introductions for them both, uh, which will be followed by some sort of guiding questions that will be um, done by Kathy. So first we have Suyapa Portillo. Um, Suyapa Portillo is a, uh, currently is Associate Professor of Chicano, Chicana, Latino, Latina Studies, uh, Transnational Studies at Pitzer College. She received her PhD in Latin American history from Cornell her research and teaching interests broadly include Central American history, Central American migration to the US, gender and labor in Central America and Latin America, LGBTI Latino, Latino populations and queer migrations in the Americas. Um, has a, a, a book coming out this year uh, titled Roots of Resistance, uh, which is out this spring, uh, it was, which is going to explore the history of the 1954 strike in Honduras, uh, in the North Coast of Honduras, in the U.S. to, sorry, in Honduras, um, in the formation of a national labor movement. Uh, it would be centering the lives of agricultural banana workers through the use of, uh, heavy use of oral history. After the U.S. backed coup the time that destroyed democracy in 2009 in Honduras, uh, Portillo uh, worked with organizations in Honduras and the U.S. to denounce the coup and organize transnational organizations um, and responses among the intellectual community local immigrant organizations and with embattled Hondurans on the ground defending their civil and political rights. She remains very active uh, and involved and is committed to the scholarly and organized, organizing circles, which persevere uh, in denouncing the coup and the human rights violations that are currently taking place in Honduras specifically. So we um, appreciate Fiapa you know, for being here with us. Um, 
And then the second person we have is Marisa Cardenas, uh, who is an associate professor of English and the faculty affiliate for Latin American Studies, um, of the program in Social Cultural Critical Theory and the Institute of LGBTQ Studies at the University of Arizona. Her research and teaching interests focus on US Central Americans, Latinx cultural productions, marginalized identities and subjectivities, disability studies, and transnational community formations. She is the author of Constituting Central American Americans, Transnational Identities in the Politics of Dislocation, published by Rutgers in 2018, uh, which highlights the historical sociopolitical processes that have facilitated the construction of a pan-ethnic transnational cultural identity, um, Central American identity to emerge in the US diaspora. Her work has been published in journals such as Studies in 20th, 20th and 21st Century Literature, Journal of Commonwealth and Postcolonial Studies, Symbolism, Oxford Encyclopedia of Latino Latino Literature, and the Anthologies of Race and Contention in 21st Century US Media in 2016, uh, as well as US Central Americans Reconstructing Memory, Struggles, and Community Resistance, published in 2017. Her current research examines the interconnections between disability studies and Latinx studies by, by focusing on how disability discourse reinforces ideologies of race, gender, sexuality, and normalcy. And so with that, I'll pass it on to Kathy, who will uh, start posing some of the guiding questions, which uh, will then um, move on to uh, the speakers today. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Kathy. Can you all hear me? OK. Um, so uh, we'll be sharing discussion questions with me and Adriana. I'll ask the first few set of questions. and. I guess to reiterate the, the goals of this event is mainly to put Central American scholars in the diaspora in conversation and talk about some of the main issues that are occurring in the isthmus and the responsibilities that we have as scholars, engineers, members of this community. And this first panel is mainly, I guess, an introduction sort of, but to contextualize the field itself of Central American studies. So the first few questions that I have for Maritza and Suyapa are about the field itself and we're wondering, maybe we can start with Maritza. Can you share with us how you introduced or became involved with the field or study of Central American studies, but also what was your educational trajectory like, sort of in the absence of an institutionalized discipline, program, field that specifically focused on Central Americans? Uh, yes, I wanna I thank the Central American Studies Working Group, all of you. Um, Nancy Escalante, Katy Maldonado, Cristian Portillo Ramirez, and Adriana Ceron. Thank you so much. Thank, I wanna thank the labor behind the scenes and front of the scenes. I'm not technologically savvy. I know there must've been you know, more labor involved to this. And uh, I wanna actually thank everybody who's showing up, who's giving up their time, their space. You know, I know you, some of you worked, had class, put your, fed your babies, put them to bed or not. And so I, I don't take you all for granted. Oh, how did I become involved? Um, well, I'm, I'm a daughter of an immigrant. My sister was born in El Salvador. I, I was born here. So El Salvador was always in my household, but never in my studies ever. Uh, at some point I learned that if I was going to learn anything about my, my cultural background at large, it was gonna have to be like almost independent study. Um, I went to, I'm a proud community college. If you're, I'm, I'm gonna combine both questions. I, I, um, I went to Pasadena City College, got an academic probation, <laughs> moved to Rwanda Community College, <laughs> and then transferred to USC. And I'm proud of those working class roots. I'm first gen. Um, you know, I didn't go to university. I didn't know how to fill out a university form. And there's no, I'm going to ask my immigrant mom to help me fill it out. She didn't even know what FAFSA is, you know. So uh, I'm always, uh, I'm, pr I'm, I'm proud of that. And I, I think about the limitations for future generations and, and how that affected us. So uh, I went to USC where I studied comparative literature and I didn't get much on, you know, Central Americans. I got one mention of Ruben Darío, uh, you know, and that was it. So then, um, so I, I, three things happened historically. So I'm always big on that. That's my personal narrative, but the historical forces also came to be. Uh, one of them was that I had a, a great mentor at Michigan my first year there, John Gonzalez, and he, um, gave me a copy of Ana Patricia Rodriguez's article that came out in 2001, uh, Refugees of the South, uh, U.S. Central Americans and the Latino Imaginary. And I read that and I was like, wow, first there's like references to like, you know, Los Tigres, Tigres del Norte. Like it had like, it was a very cultural studies take. So I'm like, you can study Central, like you can write, you can do this, right? So she showed me that this was possible. So I remember that. 
Uh, I remember hearing about CSUN, the, the student movement happening back home in Northridge for a Central American Cities program. And so I thought people want this, people are, are hungry. We wanna, we wanna learn about you know, this community. And I remember, and the, the third thing I would say is I got a, a I, was, I went to a Central American literature conference at Northridge. Um, most of the panels were on, you know, Central American literature, like in the Isthmus, but in the, in the books, book selling area, uh, I ran into a group of, uh, of I want to say kids, but we weren't kids. Um, I, I ran into the Epicentros, Maya and other people selling their little chapbook and, and I bought it. And, you know, as I was reading at home, they were asking the same questions that I was asking, but they were asking it in an artistic, creative way. And so that told me that whether I would get a job or not um, to go back to the education trajectory, you know, at the time, if you wanted to study Central America, you really went through Spanish departments. We were, we, we were always seen as a Latin American issue. We really weren't seen, and this is early to, this is 20 years ago. We weren't seen as a ethnic studies like uh, group, at least not, not when I entered it. And so I remember thinking, I'm gonna study this as part of my American culture PhD. And I realized that I may not get a job. And again, working class roots, I have a cosmetology license, it may not show. And I thought, well, if I can't get a job, I can still, you know, still do hair, but I, I was gonna do it no matter what. And so my trajectory was also to kind of eschew the traditional area. So I remember at the time, it was really big to kind of study, like use borderlands theory framework, uh, migration, and I did diaspora studies. I wanted to read The Black Atlantic by Paul Gilroy. I wanted to do Stuart Hall. I wanted to do James Clifford. And so I think mine was unconventional, but also because no one really knew, there was no canon for Central American studies. So it was really uh, scary because you didn't know what you were doing, but it was also really freeing and you could go about it any way that you wanted to. Um, so yeah, that, I guess that's my narrative of how I, I came to be in the field. And so it's, I think it's a little different, but um, it might not be. I wanna hear Suyapa's story. Thank you so much for sharing Maritza and Suyapa, please <laughs> enlighten us even more. Great. Thank you again to the organizers for having me here today. Um, it's, it's really a true honor to see this happening across the country and in the East Coast, especially. Um, well, yeah, similar to Maritza, you know, we, I'm, uh, you know, I've had all these different experiences. So um, I didn't have classes on Central American studies um, in undergrad. I, I had professors in Latin American studies who sometimes covered Central America or covered Central America in, and, and it was all I could get, right? If whatever I could get. So if I took a Spanish class and we read a novel, then that was like, you know, I would latch on to that. Um, and actually I went to undergrad, uh, not to name call, but I went to undergrad with Lacey Abrego. Um, I was at Pitzer College, she was at Pomona College. And we often took some, some classes in, in Spanish literature now that you mentioned it, Marita, because that was kind of the, the connection we had to our countries, right? Like Spanish was really important. So I majored in Spanish as a, as a fact. And so right after graduating, I went to work uh, on a labor campaign, uh, a community labor campaign. We were organizing uh, garment workers. And many of those folks that we were organizing at Kiwa, the Korean Immigrant Workers um, Alliance were, or advocates were um, Central Americans. So I got to work with Hondurans and Guatemalans and they were workers in the garment industry. And it, it just became really clear as I was organizing um, for the better part of uh, five to six years that a lot of the jobs that were not unionized were the jobs that Central Americans had, right? So like when you come to LA and you can't find a job, you would do day labor work, right? So the day laborers, um, or you work in a factory, like a garment factory. And, you, you know, um, and the union jobs, because I also, so I worked for small nonprofits and then um, ended up working for the union, the Service Employee International Union, Local 399, and with healthcare workers. And so those jobs were for, there were Latinos in those jobs, but you really didn't see uh, recent Central American immigrants. So, um, you know, and, and there, there was a, a culture of like, um, when I was organizing at the union, you want, or any campaign in LA, you wanted to have a Central American in your committee. Cause you know, as organizers, we, we trained committees to do 
uh, work, to do strikes, to go protest, whatever, you know, to organize. And so you wanted to have Central Americans in your committee because they were gonna they were gonna throw down, right? They were like really good. They were like, you know, if we had to do a civil disobedience, Central Americans were not faced by it, right? Like so, so we always wanted to have Central Americans in our committees. Um, and you know, that was really intense for me. The other thing that happened to me as a both as an undergrad and then a community organizer is um for us, for my generation, the, the big struggle was Chiapas right, and the, the uprising of the Zapatistas. So um, going to, to the Zapatistas and then once I graduated, connecting with Chicanos, um, you know, who were organizing, uh, I was part of something called the El Big Frente Zapatista. And so we went down to Mexico and just kind of prepared this encuentro, right? And, and in that process, kind of finding Central America in Chiapas was really interesting for me. Um, I connected with, with a lot of, of the struggles there, um, and and then um, um, so so for me those were really foundational experiences. And then coming back to the U.S. to organize solidarity for the struggles in in for the Zapatistas was really important for me. Um, after you know six years of organizing and sort of finding that you know maybe I'm an intellectual, like maybe I want to do more research on stuff, um, I decided to go to graduate school. And I go to study Central American migration, believe it or not, that's like in early 2000s. Um, but I went into a history program. I'm, I'm deeply in the humanities. I had studied Spanish and, you know, I, and, and I wanted to go into the humanities. And I go into a program, a history program, which is where you can't be interdisciplinary in the same way that Maritza could do in American studies, for instance, or in ethnic studies. Um, now I get to do that. I couldn't, I had to choose, am I gonna focus on Latin America or am I gonna focus on US Latino or US history? Um, and so I had to make a, a decision that I wanted to really focus on the isthmus. It felt like something really important for me. So the one thing I didn't mention is I'm an immigrant and I came here when I was nine years old um, in the early eighties. Um, I had been detained with my mother um, and I was in, you know, under what it was called INS at the time, the Immigration Naturalization Service. And that experience really profoundly shaped me. And it shaped me for a lot of reasons. One, well, one being detained, it's like, you know, all kinds of trauma and PTSD and all that. But the, the thing was that I couldn't go back home until I had my papers uh, and that was around college. So that reconnecting with travel, with going back to um, Honduras where I'm from, um, traveling to Guatemala and, and other countries um, was really um, a reconnecting with something I had lost, right? We didn't have internet, we didn't have Wi-Fi, we didn't have Facebook, you know, cell phones. So, so you know, my grandma would write me, it would take 30 days for us to, for me to get the letter from my grandmother and then write her back another 30 days, right? And then hope that it didn't get lost in the mail. So, um, it was really important for me to reconnect with the isthmus and I'm really glad I did that. And then coming back from that experience, I realized I wanna do ethnic studies because um, we can, we can do ethnic studies um, in the ways where we connect both the isthmus and Central Americans in the US. I, you know, how to connect um, our experiences. So that's a little bit of how I came about and, and coming back to ethnic studies, you know, um, uh, I uh, working at the Central Market Studies program at uh, Cal State Northridge and then um, coming to Pitzer College in Chicano Latino Studies. I have found the space um, to study Central America in, in the ways that are important to me. Thank you so much. There's so much to unpack in both these little stories or trajectories. And I think we'll touch on a lot of these topics later on in the conversation. But Maritza, you mentioned that there wasn't a canon back then. And it's funny because the group here that we have, we consider both of you part of our little canon in Central American studies. <laughs> so um, I guess a little to, to ask you more about your own work and how that came about, how you came about the specific talk about in, that you research and how that intervened within the field of Central American studies, maybe how it was received or anything that you can share about your work, because it's really amazing. And maybe we could start with Manita too. Oh, 
I don't know, you know, back in my day, the canon was a bad thing. Urgh, it was like white heterosexual dudes. I'm like, do I want to be a part of the canon? Um, oh, and this is being recorded, so I think I should be more mindful <laughs> of how I frame that. Uh, it's been an honor to be in the canon. No, just kidding. Um, so how does my work uh, make, what, what interventions does it make? I always feel really, I know this is like a very academic question. I, I prepare my students that they're gonna get this. They have to write in their disc proposal. They have to answer it in job interviews. But I always feel it's a little, I mean, so I'm aware of it. I always feel it's a little disingenuous or uncomfortable because I don't feel anything's entirely uniquely my own, right? Like there was emotional labor behind the scenes. There was ideas I was building on from other people. And so I don't, I don't even, I don't even know just because I put something out there if it's made a difference, right? If there's an, if, I, if it's done anything to the field. Um, but if you're asking me what I would hope, you know, that my my work would do, is uh, I really wanted people to sort of not take uh, concepts and terms for granted. Um, and I think I've, I, I've wanted to question or interrogate terms that were used daily all the time, but never really uh, had the time to be discussed. And the two terms were Central America and Central American, right? And I learned this in grad school as I was reading about Central American histories. I, I'm, I, you know, I was, I'm interdisciplinary, you're right, so you have a, but you know, people knock on that. You're like, you're not good at anything. You know, you're all over the place. And so I, I'm a closeted historian, I love histories. And I remember having a conversation with my mom because you know, my mom would tell me, like, I would be like, why are they including Panama and Belize? And my mom would be like, well, because, you know, they're not really like, and this is not a knock on my mom. This is, she's, she's the, you know, the effect, the discursive effect of, of a history and an ideology. So this is not a knock on my mom, but she would be like, well, they're not like Central American, Central, you know, they're, they, you know, and I'm like, and then I had this very US perspective. I'm like, but look, the isthmus is like this and they, they should be part of it. And I just thought like, I think I'm asking the right questions here. Like, well, what, what constitutes Central America? Who came up with the criteria? I know it's, there's no, and I'm not here to make it static. I'm not here to, to put a concrete definition on it, but clearly it's changing. And so what, what definition are people in the media using it? Other scholars using it? When they're talking about Central America, how is it being used? Uh, and same thing with by extension, Central American. Right, so I started thinking about, well, who is included in that term? I was thinking of just basic like academic, like signifier signified. When you see the word Central American, what images do you get, right? What don't you get? And so I think you see some of those questions kind of emerge a little in my book because, you know, what I, what I was wanted to be people to be mindful is that understanding of Central American has have been naturalized and it's been linked with mestizaje and that's a problem, right? There's, an, there's an, an almost unconscious cultural nationalism linked here. And the field has often excluded uh, the voices of other ethno-racial communities. And actual, in, in what I'm, the example I gave earlier, spaces like Panama and Belize, because of these weird definitions, like, well, culturally we're not, but who, who says so? So I'd like to think that um, one of the ways my work has contributed to that conversation is to really interrogate that a little further, because if we don't do that, we're gonna keep perpetuating that erasure and that epistemic violence, right? So um, that's one of the things I'm hopeful for. I was hoping that the book would kind of do is kind of just be like, look, when we talk about Central Americans and diaspora, we've been predominantly talking about mestizos and that's not okay. Like that's the short end of it, right? Uh, the other thing I think is that other works hinted at identity, but never put that in the foreground. And I think when I was working on the book, I'm like, I wanna talk about this. I wanna talk about this identity because different people have told me that this identity doesn't exist or shouldn't exist, but I think it does kind of exist. And so uh, what I mean about, and I mean that when I say that is like the field of Latino studies at the time was very much like, look, you're either gonna be Latino or now Latinx, right, Latina, um, or you're gonna be Salvadoreña, Salvador and Salvador American, but you're not picking, there's no alternative categories here. Um, when it came to like ethno, eth ethno national terms, you know, there, you could always be, queer, or you did, but in terms of those terms, it was just very bifurcated, very dyadic. And I'm like, I'm seeing a whole bunch of people everywhere using Central America. And so I really wanted to focus on how that came to be, right? What was the context behind that? Um, some, some scholars were claiming that there, we had no identity politics. 
Um, some were claiming that it was just a purely diasporic invention, that no one in Central America uses the category of Central American. Um, I don't, I, I think my work tries to say that's not necessarily the case. I think it's a lot more prominent and highlighted here in the diaspora, but it's not something uniquely diasporic invention. So I think that my book in tackling the questions of identity was, was a little different. And certainly in kind of saying that we kind of chose a different, while well, everybody was using Latino, we were using Central American and that doesn't mean that we always disavowed Latino, but, but some did. Some preferred Central American over Latino, that was, that was a thing. And I'm not saying that it was joyous or harmonious or there wasn't internal conflict. I'm just saying that I saw something that the scholarship was telling me shouldn't be there, be there. And so I always tell students, right? Like not to not listen to the scholarship, but really follow what you see to trust your instincts and follow up your own personal observations. Um, the other thing that I, I hoped I would do is to, uh, make a case that not all subjectivities have to always already be hybrid or a border subjectivity, you know, um, and I think this is building again from an essay that Arturo Arias wrote a long time ago and the way he talked about uh, Central Americans in the US, he kind of said they weren't, he, I think the term was like that they don't, they don't have a, like a, an advanced hybridity, like he was one of the first people that didn't talk about them as always already hybrid, though he doesn't go far enough to say subalternity. But what I really thought he was saying was, you know, this is a subject position that emerges from subalternity. And that was very powerful to me because I thought, yeah, I mean, why do we always have, to, I mean, this becomes a recurring concern and theme to be mindful of monolithic categories of ways that can kind of limit the different positionalities we can hold. And so I'd like to make the case that that a US Central, or that's why you Central American American in that kind of way, because it's one that's trying to say, maybe we are hybrid, but it seems to be that it, it emerged from a space of subalternity and as a placeholder for other sort of subaltern positions that haven't made its way in dominant discussions of ethnic and Latino studies. Um, and then I'm running out. I don't know. Actually, I don't know what what how helpful it has been. I I just I do want to say that I didn't. I I was very intentional in not having chapters about what the U.S. constantly did to Central America. There was so much wonderful scholarship on that already published. I wanted us to just look at the things that no one that I never got to see as an undergrad. I wanted to figure out why you know that the activities I went to growing up, whether it's the Central American Independence Parade, why they're putting a Mora San bust like right there by, you know, they're just got them like, why that guy? You had money, why didn't you choose that dude? You know, so I, I kind of let, I let the work shape the research or I let my everyday interactions shape the research. And I think that I, I'd like to say that I contributed in the way that I focused on, you know, unconventional historical texts and conversations that maybe hadn't been talked about. And that's all I plan to do is I just, I hope to raise questions and just add a little bit to the conversation. Uh, I don't know that I was successful, but I will tell you that that's what I've tried to do. Thank you. I personally think you were very successful. <laughs> I very much like your book. Um, I mean, okay, so yeah, for now too, because I'm really excited to hear you too. Okay. Um... So, okay, so I don't consider uh, myself part of any canon um, as Central Americans. And I think Maritza kind of captured some of this, you know, we were like outsiders to everything. Even in the study of Latin American studies, you know, most studies focus on like Mexico, Argentina, Chile, the big countries. And, you know, I've been told before, right? Like you are not gonna get a job if you do Centro America or, you know, why Honduras? Like nobody reads about Honduras, right? So, um, and then in Latino studies, right? We are marginal and I have experienced that uh, both in Chicano Latino studies on both coasts, East and West Coast, uh, sort of that marginality. So the, the testament that we're, he the, the fact that we're here is a testament to peer mentoring and mutual aid among us, right? So um, coming together for either a panel or, sharing with each other resources, uh, how to write a letter, how to interview, uh, how to position oneself. And so I feel like that, you know, we're like weeds and like wildflowers, you know, kind of being born somewhere. And then someone's like, oh, they're pretty. You know what I mean? Like, um, and I, I feel like that, and that's one of the things that 
universities need to do better, particularly if they have strong departments in Latino studies and Latin American studies, is to really think about and be intentional about training Central American scholars and students and grad students in ways that are meaningful, uh, not just for the job market, but that are meaningful to the field. And I think that this is kind of uh, really important. Um, and also because of this continued migration, for example, we're seeing other centers of, my, you know, of Central American uh, communities like Houston, right? It's no longer just New Orleans, it's, it's Houston, it's you know, Miami-Dade. I spent some time in Miami-Dade County um, lots of Hondurans there, North Carolina, my entire hometown where I was born, all of the people my generation that I went to first, second, and third grade with now live in Charlotte, North Carolina, you know? So these are like pockets of, of people that are uh, existing, living, working, having children um, staying here. And so, you know, um, and it's hard. It's hard to be Central American, Honduran, Guatemalan in these areas, right? Uh, I see someone said something about the Midwest. The Midwest is it's tough, right? So um, one, because even when I went to Ithaca, New York in 2000, was it 2002, there were no tortillas, right? Like we had to talk to management about this or like queso fresco, right? So there's a lot of places that our communities are, but, but there were Guatemalans uh, milking cows right in the next town over, right? So, um, you know, there's our communities are migrating um, for the, because of this uh, history, right? That we have with the with US empire. So, so I just wanna say that because, you know, we really came up um, and, and someone at some point saw some promise in the stories we wanted to tell. And I, I wanna thank those people, but definitely, um, but the peer mentoring and mutual aid is real and it, it really worked for us, at least for some of us, right? So I don't think I'm part of the canon. I think I'm an outsider in every way. I mean, I identify as a queer femme. Can you imagine, uh, you know, while I may be accepted in immigrant communities here, it's tough being in Central America, right? And, and you know, how to out yourself and what to do. So um, I definitely question that. What I hope that my new, uh, my book will do um, is a lot of things. Um, obviously, I couldn't put everything there, but um, I, I agree with uh, Maritza. Like we're all uh, very focused on this, on on debunking mestizaje um, for when we think about Central America and, and really all of Latin America, right? And in the book, I'm a historian, so I look back at one the relationship that that Honduras, the elite in Honduras had with. Um, both the banana companies, but also the US, right? And the construction of this, uh, what Dario Raque calls the Indo-Hispanic past, right? This, this mythical idea. And you know, I grew up in Copan, just a few hours from the great Mayan city. My hometown in Copan has, um, you know, escalinatas and temples, the Mayan temples. The, the entire region is, is littered with Mayan temples. Uh, we, we, we grew up with Mayan customs, you know, in funerals and birthdays, uh, food, right? All these different things um, in my own upbringing, right? You know, um, and so we're raised and, and we, we think, right, as, as light-skinned Central Americans, right, that, that um, you know, that this, this erroneous history about indigenous people, right? That, you know, they lived and they're not here anymore, but but they are. And, and then the class issues surface, right? You see the way indigenous people are treated and, and, and everything like that. So I wanted to uh, look at that in the context of the banana workers because, and again, same as Marisa, it spoke to me. I'm gonna be really honest with you. I went to Honduras to write about the history of the Communist Party and the left uh, when I went you know, there. Like, I don't know if that was in my proposal, but it was in my head when I went there because growing up in Los Angeles, you know so many Guatemalans and Central Americans and everybody's like, oh yeah, but Honduras, you know, Honduras like se vendió, right? Honduras was the airport to the United States. And it's true, right? The, the Honduran government uh, aided in the killing and assassination of the, you know, of the uh, and assisted the contras and and torture and like things that we haven't even discovered yet, right? Um, but I really think that um, the the one thing we don't know is that there's a long history of resistance 
and people like you know i'm wearing the, the berta caceres uh, shirt made by a Hungarian, of course and um and you know berta fought with the fmln in el salvador like that's how close the countries are and many of the folks that i interviewed ended up fighting uh, with the fsln in nicaragua and having you know there was a, there was a solidarity in the region right but when i got there i didn't see that necessarily right those were the the clandestine stories that are really hard to tell if you're not an insider in the culture there so lots of times um what i did see was everyday life and i try to piece together in this everyday life how does gender labor how does how does the work of banana uh picking in the agricultural fields connect to gender and race right and who are these migrants coming to Honduras? In fact, by the 1940s, there were over 220,000 Salvadorans migrating to the North Coast, right? The Salvador migration to the North Coast of Honduras, to the Caribbean areas, or what we call the Circum Caribbean of Honduras, is really important and critical history that hasn't been written about because guess what? It was undocumented migration, right? I've looked through the annals of, of you know, the of, you know the, the consular records and there's very little there, right? Because people, uh, were poor people and they were migrating um, like that. So, so I hope that 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 to texture that world um, and to see what what that was like, right? Um, I'm also really interested in how resistance is is made. Uh, for example, how does resistance happen um, in everyday acts in women's everyday acts? So, I like for instance, uh, women cooks, right? Why does that matter? You think? Um, because we don't have these earlier historical accounts um, to go back to. We have a lot on the 1980s, as Maritza mentioned, but we don't have this earlier history. And guess what? Central Americans existed then, right? Like we, you know, we have this long, rich history uh, that, um, you know, and and Chiapas was part of Central America in the colonial period, and and so these are all related. And so I wanted to to write a story that would help um young honduras both here in the us but also in honduras understand that resistance doesn't just happen like that you know that there's a historical roots to how resistance happens um i mean i did get to uncover a little bit about the communist party and so you can read some of it there so that's kind of what i hope that project does my new project um is really surrounded it's surrounded around queer, queer migration and that's that's a project that found me and the reason why it found me is because i'm queer and so when i went to honduras this this was difficult it's difficult to be a queer in honduras um to be even though i present as a feminine you know uh, as a femme and uh, you know when you get to know people right you know do you out yourself and then when you out yourself, what does that mean so um after the coup d'etat in 2009 um there were uh, in, an, a, a severe increase in transgender murders. Honduras had 17 trans murders from 2004 to 2009. And then in one year, there were like, I think over 20 or 23 murders of transgender people. Obviously the military was in the streets. They were, you know, and so that, this project found me. That's why I say, because I came out to talk about these issues, both in Honduras, internationally, like, in 2009, there were several scholars who we were doing so much uh, press and talking to Congress about, you know, reverting the coup or like human rights violations. And so I just ended up having to out myself like, well, how do I know these things, right? Oh, well, because I know organizations, because I know these, these contacts. And, you know, to the point where like, we had the list of those murders, um, do we make those public even though their families didn't know that they were queer or that they were out or what had happened, what happened to them, right? So um, some of those questions were really intense and, and working with this a, a very white solidarity movement, right? Because what was left over from the 1980s uh, wars in El Salvador, Nicaragua, Guatemala, then the solidarity movements that were constructed there, they were very white solidarity movements with structures that that are very much like NGOs so this notion that this 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 practice I grew up with of mutual aid among Central Americans of 
peer to peer solidarity. Um, you know, Marita and I were discussing this earlier this week, like, you know, my mom always gave posada or housing to some immigrant at some point. And so there was always people in my house, you know, that, that, that never paid us a cent, you know? And so it was like, it was understood that these people needed, needed this. And so, um, that was hard. It was hard to do queer solidarity or to be a queer woman of color in that white context that didn't understand, right? Um, these mutual aid practices that that exist in our community. For example, if you don't have money to, you know, my I've known family members that do this. If they don't have money to send home, because you know, I've inherited my mother's remittances. I don't know if you all know that. If that's gonna happen to you, be ready. But I've inherited, like my mom's like, oh, so and so had a kid, and like I thought you could, you know send the money so he can go to school or or something like that, right? So all of that mutual aid gets lost in the way in which solidarity movements get um, projected from NGOs, right? Um, all of that one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And so I stepped away from that, um, understanding that that's not how I do solidarity and acompañamiento, right? Which I was taught from, from my own childhood and from my own organizing experience. Um, and and began to build connections with people directly and and see how I can be useful to projects and then bring others along with me right so other people of color that were interested in doing that and I think that that's been sort of um, a really powerful process for me because um, always trying to build collectives I mean if if I if I you know because collectives that we build are hard to sustain um, because, you know, there's no funding, there's no someone reminding you about meetings or, you know, it really has to come from deep personal collective. And, you know, one example is the May Day Trans Queer Contingent, which was useful to raise awareness about immigration here in Los Angeles, but it was also important to connect trans women transnationally. So connecting trans women here in Los, in Los Angeles and other countries to trans efforts in Honduras, right? Um, it was important to raise awareness with elected officials here in the US who were kind of exoticizing us for being queer Latinx, right? But then we could, we had their ear to talk about Honduras, right? Um, so anyways, I could go on about this, but I, I think I kind of, you know, I'll stop there. Thank you so much. and. This was wonderful, and I'm so glad that we had we get to have this conversation and talk about these many topics that I don't think we would have had otherwise or in the past. And thank you for challenging us and questioning our role in academia and the way that we see each other and really how we position ourselves within this messy institution. And the next following sets of questions, Adriana kind of asked us to consider that too. So I'll pass it along to you. Uh, once again, thank you so much, Professor Siapa um, and Maritza for being here today. Uh, and these sets of questions um, are getting more at what can we do as scholars to create a bridge uh, between academia and local communities uh, to create a more uh, justable and equitable society. Um, so to start off as my first question, um, as scholars, practitioners, uh, teachers, and professors um, in Central American studies, what is our responsibility to the communities that we serve? I can go unless you want to, Marita. No, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you for asking this question. I really love it. Um, I even like the way you phrased it, these communities we serve. If you talk to any other scholar, they're gonna be like, what? Right? Because the way graduate schools are set up is you work on yourself, right? It's all about self-promotion self-publication, you know, um, you know, kind of how do you shine, right? Never about the community. Um, so, so I like that uh, for you asking that. Um, listen, I have a kind of a long answer, but I'm gonna try to, to keep it down. So um, the title of this talk was, you know, Central American Crisis and how to make sense of it, right? And I was reflecting on that. And I, I get a little bit triggered by the word crisis. Um, and the reason is because when we think about 
Central American crisis? Do we refer to what's going on in Central America right now? Do we refer to what's going on in the US-Mexico border, right? And, um, you know, are we talking about the crisis of US intervention? Are we talking about, you know, NAFTA and CAFTA, right? These free trade agreements that destroyed um, any kind of living wage in Central America, right? That, you know, um, that, that has established two tiered systems of pages. Um, and, you know, and so I feel like, again, I'm a historian, right? And so I want to evaluate that historical context. And, and I want to think about structures that are generated from, from that, right? So, um, and, and, and that were created in the region, you know, because of this uh, problematic relationship that we have uh, with the United States. And, and now Canada and 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 Europe, right? Um, these forces that I, you know, that are the U.S. empire, right? Can we begin to can we be, begin to talk about the crisis of U.S. empire? Um, you know, violence. Like we are not born inherently violent in places like Honduras and Salvador or Guatemala, right? Violence is something that's constructed from from structures of oppression like that, right? It doesn't come from nowhere. It is constructed, you know, by U.S. involvement uh, and the U.S. supporting bad governments, like the one in power in Honduras right now, for instance, right? Or even Nayib Bukele in El Salvador, um, even Ortega, which is really sort of you know, an issue, right, right now in Nicaragua. So the crisis, what about the crisis of capitalism, right, and free trade, um, which generate poverty, the crisis of the United Fruit Company and Standard Fruit Company in Honduras, which for over 100 years devastated the country, right, um, with a monocrop model of export, which rendered most of, you know, it was useful only to the companies, not to the country, not to development, uh, if you would, or, or to people. And this is kind of what what I found, right? So, um, and have sort of gotten in the way of liberation in places, right? Uh, you know, like in in El Salvador and Guatemala and Nicaragua, right? So, so the crisis of capitalism and U.S. intervention are things I want to talk about because it doesn't mean that talking about that we disconnect from Central Americans in the US, I find that that's more of a connection, right? So for me, um, thinking about that is really important. Um, when it comes to, to gender rights, for example, in places like Honduras or El Salvador or, or Guatemala, like there was suffrage in the mid century, but then there was no political uh, public policies to address you know, uh, changes, right? If you think, when we think about the US and, and the development of gender rights and the movement, you know, it, it's very different, right? Than, than when you think about Central America, there isn't a development of gender rights. For example, in Honduras, suffrage was in the mid fifties, but there was no laws or public policies until the nineties when the feminists began organizing around those years, right? So we need to be honest about this history, um, not in a way to, always go back to it and to infringe us from, from writing about Central Americans right now, but that we are informed by them when we think about Central Americans, because there's there's this, um, we're inheriting, you know, some of these histories, whether we like it or not, that those are part of us. So I think um, for me, that, and, and, and the second thing I wanna talk about is, is being an internationalist, right? It's really important for me um, and to be an internationalist doesn't mean that I'm going to organize these solidarity campaigns and bring 10 North Americans to Honduras so they can really understand how hard people struggle and charge them $1,500 so that they can experience the jungle and to experience how people are organizing. No, when I say that, I mean, how do Central American peoples in the Isthmus and here in the U.S. have agency, right? In the same breath that we talk about you know, racial capitalism and like, you know, um, free trade agreements, how do we also talk about resistance and organizing and people power? So what's really admirable to me is that the working classes, the indigenous and Afro-indigenous, Afro-descendants in Central America have built such a strong resistance, resilience movement. They've given us ideas and thoughts and, you know, they've like questioned everything, right? So the feminists, the trans feminists, I mean, the trans feminist movement 
it's incredible, right? Like, so for example, right? Um, in Honduras right now, everything you hear in the media is like, oh, there's violence, there's violence, there's violence. It's so violent there, the, the gang, you know, the gangs and whatever, you know what the deal is, right? Um, and there is, there's violence, there, there's chaos, there's human rights violations, we have a narco president, right? But there's also this amazing resistance, the constellation of organizers, just like me, just like us, human rights defenders who are standing up, talking back, you know, and they are sort of challenging the politics of death, right? They're, they're fighting in a different way uh, than we have seen it here in the US, right? And then linking that to the struggle for TPS and the struggle for DACA and the struggle for, you know, post COVID realities for our communities here. So, you know, for me to answer your question, you know, it's about kind of that acompañamiento, right? Like accompanying people and their struggles on both sides of the border, understanding the historical context where they may come from, right? What, you know, where they may engage from and how did they get to be here and why is really important to me. And I feel that when I've worked with people in the community and I understand that and my students understand that, they feel seen, they feel respected, they feel like, okay, she knows this history, you know, I don't have to, like, she gets me, you know? So I think that that's kind of how I've approached it. Um, and, you know, Adriana and, and Christian have been in my classes. So I hope that I, that was successful, but really kind of starting out with that historical context that's not just about what happened in the past, but, you know, kind of being critical about, uh, you know, those movements, those systems, those structures that have oppressed people. Thank you so much, Suyapa. Yeah, I mean, I, I echo everything um, Suyapa said, and I, I was thinking about the title of this Central America in Crisis from a Central American perspective. And I'm like, what is this, again, I'd be very obnoxious, but what does a Central American perspective mean? When, when has the isthmus not been in crisis? It depends the subject lo location you hold, right? So when you're colonized and independence and you're subjugated, just because the US wasn't necessarily right then and there, there was still crisis there, you know? And so, I mean, I, I think about this now, the way we kind of like, the way sometimes it's just too attached to some US interest in sort of, uh, in our, our zealousness to sort of contest anti-imperialism, and, and we should, we, we forget the different sort of mini crises within the isthmus, right? So that you have, for instance, uh, in Nicaragua, uh, those Sandinistas being completely racist against, you know, the Bluefields Coast, marginalizing them who wanted to work with the US forces. There's a crisis there. Is it a crisis that gets talked about, that we acknowledge, not necessarily? And so to me, Central America has always been in crisis. When has it not been in, depending on the subject location you hold, right? And so I think for me, it's very, care, I'm very, I'm very like hesitant, right? I'm not the Central American's perspective. I'm very aware of sort of my privilege. I'm US born. Um, I also didn't have money to travel back and forth to Central, to El Salvador. It cost a lot of money. When I got to fly back, it was DACA. And my mom took me during the offensiva. And I'm like, why are you, and like, as a US, why are you taking me to a war zone? We just spent the last 10 years helping people leave this place. We have no money and you're sending me back, you know? And so I, I want to just kind of ground this to say that if the, the crisis depends where you're, who's defining this, where you're coming from. And so, uh, again, I think that for some communities, there's never been respite. You look at, you know, indigenous communities in Guatemala, you look at uh, struggles for sovereignty, uh, in the in the coast of Central America, and this includes Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, uh, for different diasporic communities who are often not part of this Central American diasporic conversation. Um, so I want to be very mindful and, and acknowledge that. In terms of how we do community work and community building, I always say this is a multi-pronged approach. Uh, Central American Studies was a grassroots movement. So Yapa has mentioned this before, right? Uh, we, we didn't have any way, but students wanted this. It was student led. It wasn't top down. It was bottom up. And I think we need to honor that. And we, and, and but I also want to say that I think that the scholars that started were risk takers. Um, whether it was Ana Patrice, people not knowing if you're going to get jobs. I can't tell you. People are like, are you really going to get a job? 
you know, you're A, you're interdisciplinary and two, you're focused. There's no, there were no job descriptions for Centro Americanos when we went to grad school. There, that's insane to me that I see that now. I'm happy for it, but no, nobody was asking for that. So it was taking a chance. And, and we stand here on the sh shoulders of our mentors and people, and, and, and we found ways to make community, as Yapa said, in, 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 in academic spaces. But I also want to think about how academics can reach out to community members. Um, those of you that are much, I'm a more humanities oriented, but I know some humanities people that do this, you can be uh, experts and testify for asylum cases, right? Like, you know, there's, there's, there's tangible concrete skills that we have. We can help people fill out forms, you know, for, you know, because we can help them with literature. So there's concrete everyday things that we can do. It's the way we approach teaching and pedagogy. This sounds romantic. I know I'm gonna sound super old with this. I'm a, but it, I still, some part of me feels like there's consciousness raising in that. You know, that when I teach you uh, something about, when you, you read about the, the, the horrors of, of crossing Mexico and the violence, you cannot unsee that. You know, when I talk about, uh, when we do Rigoberta Menchu and there's a chapter where she picks up the, dis, and this is trigger warning for a lot of people here. I'm gonna, and I should have trigger warning before and I, I do apologize. But this is real trigger warning, as, and this comes from my own household. The dismembered bodies of, of, a, of, a, of a friend that she had, right? And she puts them together, I think it's in a basket. You know, it forces us to reconcile with the, the US sponsored violence, but the continuous, I call this epistemic violence, as Latinos in Guatemala still deny the Mayan genocide to this day. Right, so our work is not done. And so the, the space of the class is consciousness raising and we hope to make those bridges, right, to the community. We can't let them forget because these, these are the same Latin, do not, you know, these whole, you know, genocide deniers over there become and we all, you know, want to find spaces of belonging here. But that space of belonging, as much as we want it, we need to problematize it. You know, it's not, we, we cannot have, if we, we want to have these conversations about honesty and solidarity, you know, we have to sort of acknowledge the places that we come from, the privilege that we occupy. I have no problem doing with this. And again, the other thing we can do is encouraging students to write about what they know. And I don't, I really get really uncomfortable about like, I remember being at USC and they'd be like, we want you to do community service, right? And like, go to the poor neighborhoods to write about your com you know, communities. And I'm like, I live there. Like, what? I live there. You don't have... That is, I drive down the five freeway and I get up and I, I live in that poor community, you know? And so this sort of extractive politics of intellect, oh, let's go feel good, this liberal, like, let's feel good. We spent our one day. That, I'm very scared of that. And I see that a lot in like a, a liberal form of teaching of multiculturalism. And I want to push back against that. Like, I want, I want people to work with communities. I do. But it has to be in a respectful way. And I think one of the ways we start that is just by telling our students, our working class students first gen, to write from what they know. I have said this in other spaces and I'll say this again, the personal is political and it's epistemological, right? We all can sort of do this. People don't validate that, but I want you to, to validate it. I mean, there is a risk when you put your personal you know, life on there, people are gonna scrutinize it. If it's part of discourse, they're gonna take a shot at it and you have to be prepared for that. But I do, I think we encourage and mentoring and we have to, we have to find ways to mentor and we're not, let me just say, if my students are here, I know some of you know, I am not always at my best in mentoring, you know, uh, it, it's, it's tough, it's challenging. A lot for us is to unshake abusive practices that we learned, but we're told like, this is, this is what good academics do. If you care about your students, you have to do this. A lot of it is unlearning things that you, you were taught. And it, this, I can go into the psychology of even family dynamics here of trauma and abuse, but, but I, I won't. Um, but, we do our best and I, if anyone sends me an email, I will respond, maybe not always on time, maybe I'm a little late, um, but I, I always want to, I wanted to encourage you and to say, whatever your instincts are, you follow that. Don't wait, don't wait for someone, you know, to kind of, you know, do it. I, I'm here to tell you that, like I said, the personal is political and it's epistemological. Our work is not just intellectual work, it is political practice. That is Central American studies. The minute it loses that edge, we should disband this field. Like, I want out. That's it for me, I think. I think that's how you do community work. I'm not sure. So much. I, I just, I agree, I agree Maritza, so much with that. And I, I love it that you said it that way because um, you're right, um, you know, it is political practice and we've always get asked 
because a lot of us, uh, Marito's an English department, but many of us Central Americans are in Chicano Latino studies, um, as opposed to Spanish or Latin American studies. And that's a, there's a reason for that. And I think it's because of that political practice um, that, that we feel like there's some challenges there, but there's also some great opportunities to connect with the community. Um, so I love that you said that, that it is political practice. Um, I also think that there's room for a lot of difference in Central American studies, right? There isn't just one train of thought or one kind of thinking. And so that's also important to remember. Thank you so much. I think Adriana's frozen, but we have one last question and you can tackle it however, with however much you want or however little, but I think our last question is what do you envision in terms of future directions for this field, both in research wise, but also ethically and with our responsibilities and our methods and what what is the future, I guess, for this field? And I think out of the nice you started to to talk about this too and how we should disband. <laughs> no, I, I didn't mean, no, I mean, you you all stay together. <laughs> no, I, no, I, I just mean like, if it just loses that, I, I don't know, I can't imagine it, how it, I don't imagine what that would look like without, without it. I mean, I think that's how we, we started. But um, in terms of envisioning research, I think it's very important to acknowledge that research is linked to material conditions, right? Um, and by that, I mean, I know that my research was stifled by what I could afford to do. And this goes back to conversations that people don't really wanna talk about in academia, right? But we don't all have the same access to funds. Um, and this, and not just because, you know, like my, my, my single mom and I was poor and all of that, but like the institutions that we land for grad school and the institutions that we land for as, as scholars, right? And so I would have loved to have studied uh, Central American like diasporic cultural productions in New York, in Chicago, uh, in, in Houston and places. Uh, I don't have money for that. I, I, I barely had any research funds and I was grateful for the small that, that I had, right? And so, so what, what did I have to do? Well, I have family in Los Angeles and I have a car I can drive. And so I drove to Los Angeles and I stayed with my family. And, and I wish that my research was, I think the book honestly would have been better. I think I would be a, a better scholar and, and better for it, but I don't have money for that. And I'm not gonna get in debt to keep my job. That's the perpetual cycle of capitalism. And I see this with my grant students, right? Arizona makes them teach more. It gives them no research and support. And Arizona, if you're listening to me, yes, this is how I really feel. Um, you don't give them enough support. You teach them you know, too much. And so they're, and then we're expecting them to do these amazing research projects and go out. How? With what funding? Right? So the idea of knowledge production as being somehow divorced from material conditions, that needs to stop. Right? We need to acknowledge that because of where we're at at different places, we produce different projects. Right? So I want to be very mindful and respectful of that because um, I, I just think it's unfair to launch critiques about how limited the field is when maybe the limitations are linked to those material conditions, right? And so in a perfect world, so now let's pretend that that wasn't, right, a thing. Uh, and you guys have, you land in wonderful institutions with lots of money and support. Uh, this is where, I mean, if I had like things I'd like to see different um, is, I, I really would like us to decenter Los Angeles, <laughs> California, as having as someone who just did it right. You're going to be like, "What a hypocrite!" I, I just told you I drove down there, but um, I think we really need to be to start further decentering Los Angeles as the epicenter of Central American uh, cultural production. Uh, it, and by decenter, I don't mean that we stop doing it. I don't mean that we erase. I just mean that we need to sort of add to the discussion here. And so, a lot, so I mean, so it's not just to say don't write about or if you're writing about it, you're a marginal. No, I'm not saying that at all, right? My, my notion of decentering is that we just need to have more research on other spaces, right? So it's not just saying don't do that. Um, the other thing that I really, I really would like to see is focus on other migration 
movements or periods, right? We are very 70s, 80s uh, civil war focused, understandably so. I totally get it. But if we followed other migration patterns, it would actually diversify and make the field heterogeneous like it needs to be, right? So before the large amount of Salvadoreños and Guatemaltecos, we have Panamanians, Hondurans, and Nicaraguans as the largest group of Central Americans in the US. And they're actually all in the East Coast because they're formal, pan they're canal workers, right? That after their canal jobs end up in the East Coast. So look at the rich uh, intellectual history we could have done if we would get a little bit, pa not past the war, but if we just start looking at other periods of time, we would see the rich sort of, they're the, the founding sort of ethnic communities in New York for other black communities and other black solidarity movements and projects in New York. And yet you would, you, you, this doesn't really come up. And I know there's promising scholars that are doing this work. Shout out to those of you I'm not on social media. I don't, I'm not as, as clever. I'm, I'm reading stuff little by little, but I do know that I, I do know that just from history, right? Like think about it, the canal, the Marines in Nicaragua and, and United Fruit Company Honduras all led to different migration periods. So Los Angeles is the focus because we're so focused on the civil wars. If we can move and start amplifying and looking at other periods, we're gonna get to other parts of the US, right? We're gonna see what it looks like on the East Coast, on the Midwest, in the South, in the global South, right? So I, I'd like to see a focus on that. Um, and so in, in that saying that, like, you know, the, the cautionary tale that it, sometimes it feels like it's very Salvadoran centric and Mestizo centric, right? So to go this thing that it feels like it's Salvadorans were, were producing and there's, hey, I'm Salvadorian, where's my mom? Shout out to Wanaka's out there in the house. But some, but the, the discussion has been, it, it, it has been just production volume seems to be a lot of focus on Guatemalans and Salvadoreños. A focus on indigenous communities, Afro-Central Americans, Black Central Americans. I don't know why they're not part of the discussion. I wanna acknowledge here grad students that I've met, Nicole Ramsey, who's doing wonderful work in Belize. I wanna acknowledge, um, Alicia Ivan Estrada, who has been working on the Mayan diaspora for 20 years now. One of the first people that I've known was so critical of Mestizaje and Central Americanist link with Mestizaje, who is not recognized. So I think also citational politics reading, I mean, taking the time to read about not just that West part of Central America, please start reading about the stuff and get past, you know, even the Salvadoran dominant narratives, you know, that aquí no había mucha comunidad negra, you know, my mom, this horrific mestizo nationalism. No, there, blackness is everywhere in Central America, but blackness is always constantly disavowed. That is the one thing I've discovered. So let's just have those honest discussions about race, like up in front, not tap dance about that. I'd love to see more of that. Um, like, like, let's do it. Uh, the wonderful work of Suyapa is already going to address one of my other envisioning things, more focused on gender and sexuality and trans movement. There was nothing like that in grad school. How powerful. I, I would love to read Suyapa's book. You know, like people want to be seen. Again, I go back to Su people and, and there's a, a need. Uh, my student Ruben is also working on this. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just excited for the future work that's coming out. And the last thing I want to say, and this hits home and this goes back to the personal, is I don't see discussions about disability and Central American studies. It is, an, it is the subaltern place. And I don't know, and you guys can ask me more in q and I don't know how anyone talks about migration or anyone talks about Central America without focusing on dis, disability studies, right? If you think about just physical disabilities that happen along the migrant trail, if you, think, if you think about it from a mental health perspective of PTSD, trauma, and violence, there is no way you can tell me that we're not dealing with issues of disability in our communities. And yet no one is really getting there and writing about it in ways that we, we need to have. I mean, there's, there's, I'm not saying that no one has done it for any of these, I'm just saying we need more of it, right? And we need it not to be marginalized. So that, that's my kind of pseudo wish list. Uh, I'm sure Suyapa has that cool idea. Yeah, Suyapa's so doing part of my wish list, by the way. I should acknowledge my wonderful colleague who's already, you know, on her way to do the wish list. Yeah. No, Marita, that was wonderful. I I want to sign up to your wish list. I agree. I think um, the the critical thing 
for us is to contend with that with racism, both in the isthmus and here. And the conversation on race here is a little easier to have than when you go back to Honduras or when you go back there. So what I want to add, I want to second your list and, and I want to add that dialogical, like we should be participating in congresos in Central America, like the Congreso de Historia Centroamericana. And the reason is because we need to also engage with those ideas there, right? It's interesting because here, many of us are working class scholars, like we came from working class roots, but when we go to Latin America or, or the Central American Americanisms, uh, that may not be the case, right? And so I feel like those are, it's important for, for them to, when I, when I first went back to Honduras in 2006, as a, you know, as a grad student, I felt like a fish out of water in, at the university there, right? Because, uh, you know, and I felt more connected with the working classes. And, and that's because, you know, I feel more connected with the working classes. I come from an immigrant working background here in the US where I was raised. And, and I, but I think we need to have those discussions on race. And, and I mean, I see the intellectual work of Dario Urake, for example, going back to Honduras, publishing in Spanish, right? And to be able to uh, have those discussions, whether it's, you know, on, on Zoom kind of uh, ways, if you can't travel, um, you know, citing, citing each other is really critical. And I remember the first person to tell me about why we, sh we should be doing that. And not that I, I didn't know, right, that, you know, was, was Lacey Abrego. She says, you know, you have to, we have to read each other and we have to learn to cite each other um, because we're, we're in this group together, right? Like, and, and I, I'm very careful about that, right? So, so having this list that Maritza listed out would make our Central Americans in the US classes uh, amazing, right? Because we're always having to pull from different directions. You know, I really feel that we need to, I, I agree with the idea of not just focusing in Los Angeles. I was so moved by the DMV area where I spent some time doing research. You know, the, the, the Valiada, uh, trucks versus the taco trucks in the in the East Coast, right? I just felt really connected with with folks there. Uh, Miami Dade, I, I spent some time in Miami Dade County, and and getting to know very recent Hondurans and and what their their issues are, right? Like so, and I, I just wanted to connect those and and talk more about that. I feel that we also need to um, write about undocumentedness, uh, DACA students who are Central Americans. I have a hard time finding literature on DACA Central Americans or TPS Central American, Central Americans with TPS or NACADA or any of these other programs. I think it's really important to write about those. Um, and then, you know, I use, um, and now that we have Pablo Lopez Oro ca call out right there, I see you texting, um, you know, it's, it's amazing because I can assign that work, but before that, when I want to talk about Garifunas in New York or Garifunas in the US, you know, pulling from anthropologists, pulling from, you know, amazing work, right? But that wasn't written from this perspective of, you know, a Black Honduran who's like lived there all their lives, you know what I mean? Like, so I feel like we need to also write for our, not just for ourselves and for, for our US audience, but also for that Central American audience. You know, when I sent out the announcement about my book, Everybody in Honduras was like, and it's in Spanish. I can't read English. You know, like we we have to communicate because we have to lift each other up on both sides of the border. That's really important for me to support the different movements, right? The feminists, the young women. I'm really concerned with young college students in Central America because once they get a degree, if they're working class and they get a degree, what's next? There's there's nothing next. There's no way to go to grad school. There's no money. There's no becas. There's no fellowships, right? So we must continue to to work with students there because, you know, otherwise. And and I I love everything I've ever read about Central America, just about right. Because but uh, we also need the production of Central Americans in Central America to come to the U.S. Right? Like having that interaction is is critical for me. And if I mentor historians in the field, I that's an exercise I have them do, right? Like you, you have to practice your Spanish. It doesn't have to be perfect, but
but you know, you can just, whatever you can do. I believe that it's important to understand how Central Americans themselves have narrated themselves in, in the isthmus and then here, right? To me, that's, that's critical and important um, and humbling, right? Like um, some of these great interactions. Um, there's also like sociological conferences, there's, you know, literature conferences. And, you know, with this, I've done them via Skype and via Zoom. So if you don't, if you can't travel, um, you can always participate that way. And there's, there's, people are eager to, to learn from you, right, as well. Um, I want to know more about resistance in different ways. Uh, we have been taught to write about resistance in certain ways. Um, you know, and, and I want to hear what you all think about it from your own sort of, um, you know, from that mutual aid practice. Right? Um, you know, how did uh, communities uh, subsist and resist, like without documentation, without welfare, without anything, right? And, and I think that that's, that's really important. I'm fascinated by the working class. People sometimes can't read me because they're like, she's doing this stuff on the strike and then she's doing this queer migration stuff. And then here's some stuff about the coup. What I like to say is I'm forever moved by the working classes, um, the black working classes, the you know the, the uh, feminist working classes, right? Like, what are indigenous feminists doing? Um, how are they resisting? How are they completing? And and I feel like to me that really honing, you know, those voices is is it critical and important? Why? Because and you all know this, right? the way we are presented and the way we are talked about in the media is as victims. We're victims of violence. We're victims of, you know, uh, poverty. We're victims, you know, and, and the narrative kind of worked in the eighties because, you know, you were trying to stop the war, you're trying to stop invasions and, and that kind of stuff, but, but it doesn't work for us now. We're very different people. So, you know, Thinking about solidarity totally different now, right? Because you are someone with a voice. You come from this, this great struggle. The other thing is also we can't assume that everybody has had the same experience that Maritza and I had, have had, right? Like, you know, there's also other Central Americans that have, you know, their, their families have been here for maybe two generations, right? And so their connection to El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. And I've had students like that, right? Um, it, it's, it's kind of different. What I said earlier was that there's room for everybody here, right? That um, we that it's not about nationalism or anything, but that that you can have different trains of thought and thinking, right? You can have you know folks that really like, for example, what we've seen, right? There's a whole literature. Uh, folks that work in literature and in Spanish, right? And from that perspective, have been able to write. Um, these, you know, and, and Mana Patricia is one of those really interesting uh, writers and thinkers, right? Um, who's been able to produce work in both languages. Um, you know, um, Alicia Estrada as well, right? I agree with you on that. And, and I feel like, you know, Lacey Abrego is, is a beautiful writer in English and in Spanish as well. Um, you know, um, I try, you know, I'm not as great. I'm, I'm, I feel like I don't speak any language, but I try. And so, um, and, and I feel like that's really important, right? So in Spanish, you do have this, this, this role, this work to do with our counterparts in Central America, right? We have to teach them about the 30 year old movement of Central Americans here in the US. They don't understand how we organize ourselves, right? They don't see us very well, right? We have to also talk about gender um, and how gender and immigrant communities manifest that may be different from Central American feminists. And, you know, we tried earlier on kind of engaging um, these two worlds, right? And, and they're very different. Um, and we have to kind of dialogue without that sort of interlocutor that we had before, which was that white solidarity movement. You know, we have to be able to see cara a cara these different worlds for ourselves, whether we do it via Zoom, via Facebook, I mean, I'm amazed at the Garifuna community and, and how they communicate via Facebook and how they engage with each other, 
you know, and, and are connected with each other constantly. So, so that's one thing, right? So, so being able to do that kind of work is really important. Um, other trains of thought, then there's folks that want to work with sort of US, you know, that's all you work with. You focus on the US, that's fine, right? We need to have different areas of thinking so we can build the field here, right? We can't all be the same, you know what I mean? And so, and exactly, right? Um, you know, how do we look at the Garifuna digital spaces as opportunities, you know, for our undocumented family members and friends, right? Who want to do research, but, you know, are unable to travel. So that's, that's really critical for me. Um, and then race, ethnicity, class. That's, that's something that, that, that's another sort of, you know, uh, a project, you know, within Central American studies, right? Um, and that we need to challenge all of us, right? Particularly um, to do that. And it's, it, you know, I, I feel like working with Mayan communities in, in the, the Zapatistas in Southern Mexico, um, working, you know, in, in solidarity with, with Garifuna communities in Los Angeles, in Los Angeles and in, in, in uh, Honduras. Um, I feel like it's so, I, I've been taught in so many ways, different ways of thinking, processing the world. Um, and I've been taught about the importance of voice and space and when we need to give space and provide that space and when we need to step back, right? And so that delicate balance is, is critical. But I've gone on for too long. So, I mean, those are kind of the, the things I would like to see. I, I really do feel that we are capable of building our very own forms of solidarity and mutual aid that reflect who and where we come from versus what we think is going to be effective with the US Congress or what's going to be effective with you know getting funding or anything like that. Listen, we sell tamales sometimes to send money home. I know many of your mothers have done this, right? To send money home, you sell tamales to you know bring down the union leadership at J for J. And I got to see that personally, right? You built tamales, you know, you we can do this. Do we need outside funding? Do we need anything else? So, anyways. I want to leave it like that because sometimes we don't know that we are capable of doing these things. And I, I've learned this so much from Honduras this past 10, 11 years, you know, Hondurans believe that it is in their hands to, to make the changes that they need to make. And, and I want to respect that. And again, respecting my privilege that I don't live in Honduras, you know, I'm not experiencing all that, you know, but how can I walk alongside those Hondurans that are experiencing that? And how can I support and create spaces, particularly Garifuna Hondurans, right? Uh, particularly indigenous Hondurans, create those spaces um, for them to walk and for them to exist and for them to have a voice, you know, without having my myself as an interlocutor. So I'll stop there because I get good. I'm a talker, sorry. Thank you so much. Um, I, we have, well, basically, essentially two minutes left, but we have so many good questions. And I think, Nancy, if you're able to stay, everyone, it'd be great to continue this conversation and maybe ask a few questions from the Q&A. Yeah, um, there we got some really good questions. There's two that I'm going to put together just because they're kind of similar. Uh, the first one comes from Marcela Gomez. How do we as undergraduate students go about justifying the need for a Central American Studies program? Is the justification, uh, if the justification is not understood, how do we demand for it? For context, I go to UPenn and there are very few opportunities to study Central America in class with mentors, um, except for maybe in archaeology. And Alejandra Mejia asks, what are some of the key next steps in further legitimizing and institutionalizing the field? These are like action questions. I like this. Um, I could tell you what um, what is what, I, and I we I don't know if there's anyone here from UCLA, right, that can speak to this or or Northridge. Um, the key for undergraduate students, Marcela, is to come together and talk about what you want to see, 
And I feel like if you're able to build a petition and have those meetings with whether the chairs, the deans, um, but it's about getting other students involved and having those discussions um, you know, doing what, for example, uh, students here at Yale were doing, which is kind of having working groups, uh, organizing, as Kristen says, right, um, and having those discussions and and figuring out what is it that that you want to learn more. I could tell you, and and I, I think it's okay. My chair wouldn't be upset, but students in in our university uh, do come to us and want to see uh, more Afro-Indigenous. Uh, discussions in classes, for instance, right? They want to decenter, um, you know, the studies so that we include the Circum Caribbean as well as the Central American Isthmus, not just um, Chicanos in the U.S. They want to see more immigration, and so students come, right? Organized in a way, you can't come, go alone, right? And and create a, a something important. I like the way that I like the bringing us together for discussion. Um, like this, you know, maybe even even more uh, down to earth and just kind of a dialogue among people. Um, and don't be afraid to organize the community. So I don't know what you have at UPenn, but here or in New York, or if you're in, you know, a big city, finding out those community organizations. Uh, I know that the Central American Studies program at CSUN got started with community organizations, right? Garesen, uh, you know, um, and, and other groups that, that were really important. So yeah, it's about organizing, bringing people together, having the conversation and not going at it alone. So I'll just, I'll just add to, yeah. And to go back to the, some of the things that Suyapa said, it's, you know, solidarity, look at the other sort of, uh, communities and student groups that are on campus. Don't, don't assume that if you see, for instance, a different group that they're not talking about Central Americanos there, they, they might be, but you just don't know because it, it doesn't, it's not under the banner. Remember, there's, there's no racial category or ethno or even language, right? Spanish is not the language of Central America, right? There's multiple languages spoken there. So, I mean, it, it might be that Central America is on your campus but you're, you're thinking of it from a very particular kind of way that you don't see. But if you explore that campus, you might. And to echo what Suyapa said, organize, yes. Uh, pick, if you have open topics to write about as an undergrad class, write about Central America. You will educate your faculty, your TAs along the way, but they might get an interest in that too. They might, if enough of you start writing about it, they're like, huh, I have, you know, these. So, I mean, there's, there's tangible things that you can do, right? And so, we always feel disempowered, but there's, there, but we're not always so. And you know, I, 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 this goes back to Suyapa's need to not only find the ways that you're oppressed and and, and a victim, but but always the resistance that that we push back. That's what they were constantly saying. So if they want you to have an open topic, you write about Central America. You write about whatever it is that you want. So organize. Look at other groups. And when you have the opportunity, you, you focus on that and you'll be educating people along the way. And you might be like, I wrote, I wrote a paper on that too. Uh, so those are, and yes, reaching out to local organizations and groups uh, is, is a really good idea. I think PLC allies are critical. Um, I know, and I don't wanna speak for the Central American students at Claremont, but there are Dominicans who go to that meeting. There's other folks who, who may see themselves reflected or who want to be in solidarity. I've often had Chicano students who are like, I want to study Central America. You know, I've, I've co-written papers with uh, Chicano students, Indian students, you know, um, white American students. So, you know, finding solidarity where you can find where you can um, is critical. And when those voices come together to demand, I think that that's, um, that's the thing. I mean, that's where you see the magic, right? But organizing and having steps uh, to the, building steps uh, to that process. So I think a good group to ch reach out to is the UCLA uh, Central America Unica, and particularly Jennifer Carcamo. I don't know if she's here, right? And and the people of Uceo, right? And and see how they were able to build um, that program, which is really effective. Um, for Ale Mejia's question, what are the next steps? Can you repeat the question? 
Yeah, that was um, for both professors. What are some of the key next steps in further legitimizing and institutionalizing the field? So I think you might have answered a little bit. I might have. I might have. I mean, I just I think we need to publish. Uh, <laughs> we need to get published. We need to get jobs, right? Um, we are in a field that uh, where we're not seen, and most of the jobs out there are are not for us, right? So I think that's that's critical. So one of the things, and and the reason I I like to publish with students is because nobody really as an undergrad ever talked to me about that you know um nobody ever even when i was in grad school it was it was difficult like i knew i had to publish but nobody really walks you through that process and it's really important i think if it's an under uh, even uh, even as undergrads to have a blog and i know that it's a it's sometimes people are afraid because you know there's this call out culture and everybody's on everybody in social media but figuring out ways to you know I, my heart was bursting when I to a couple of days ago when I saw uh, the beating that uh, the military in Guatemala gave to Honduras on this caravan. Like I just was desperate, and the best way to for me to to communicate that was to write it down. I mean, it's it's not something ready to go yet, but it's something that I could write down. And and you can do that when you see things that are unjust. Like write them down. You know, like write down a list of topics that you can you know have comments on or write a blog on or you know um and, and kind of throw yourself out there in that way because I, it's really important to to write otherwise we're not creating anything you know um i use adriana Seron's uh pieces for migrant roots media in my classes no it's it's really exciting to when i come across a central american piece and I could throw it in my Central Americans of the US, you know, syllabus or and talk about, you know, uh, who undergrads are. So, and it, you know, I assign undergrad writing as well. So we need to write, we need to think, we need to put it out there. We need to be in community that way as well as going to conferences or, or like just as Twitter, like instead of writing that Twitter tweet or that Facebook post that took you all fucking night, write an op-ed, you know, instead of posting about something, make it something where you, your train of thought gets out there. And you know what, if you make mistakes or if people challenge you, you know, that's a learning process as well, right? Uh, I real quickly, I just, I'm really ambivalent. Like, I don't, I don't need you to, the, the pragmatic working class girls like yes we need to institutionalize we need to create jobs I want I want students that go through the process to be able to teach the conscious all the things that we said and the other part of me is like I don't need you to legitimize me I was going to do this whether you wanted me to or not it wasn't going to stop me I would have read it on, it on my own time so the word legitimizing is kind of odd for me I don't I don't need to be legit <laughs> you know uh, but I, I understand the need to create more jobs and I and I do see this as just not so in, you know not insular to academics. What Suyapa said is right. Like we need you all to write, and not just write in an academic way. We need people to create. I, I you know I am inspired by the artists that are out there, and you all are artists in your way. Like I don't have social media. I don't. So I'm you know like I always said this, but you know I I you know Victor who you know who, who was here at one point. He he does this wonderful artwork about the Central American diaspora. He is an artist. I think we support each other by writing about each other. You know, I, I think that we, I don't know about legitimacy, but we can create institutional spaces and work for each other. You know, I think this is how we help each other out. So writing about, you know, people that are unknown, you know, and I was writing about the episode, I wasn't writing about Ruben Darío. I wasn't writing about someone prominent. I was writing about, you know, a, a group of other sort of basically my peers who who I felt had something to say. So again, I don't know about legitimizing, but I do think, you know, the common answer to this, yes, write articles, you know, write books, you know, get published, get tenure, all of that will help because you can mentor, you can write letters for jobs, you can write letters for promotion and tenure, that's legit. That's a, a way we help each other on the field, but also just write. Just write art, pr produce, and don't be boggled down by what we think it should be. And the rest of us need to step up and, and put a spotlight on that and put that in the production cycle, is what I would say.
Thank you so much. Those were really great, great answers. And thank you people, um, everyone also for just sending questions in. But I'm sorry, we're out of time. So we do have to wrap up. Um, so I just want to say some few last remarks. Um, so we'd like to thank the Yale Center for the Study of Race, Indigeneity, and Transnational Migration for supporting us in developing this three-part winter colloquium. We hope today's panel provided context for the trajectory of the field and to help establish meaningful engagement between Central American studies and um, events in the Isthmus. The second panel will be happening next Thursday at 4 p.m. Pacific time, 7 p.m. Eastern time, and will bring focus to our Black and Indigenous communities in Central America and the diaspora as well as identifying the contributions and shortcomings of Central American studies in relation to the African diaspora, Blackness, and Indigenous people and, ind and indige indigeneity. This panel will host three junior scholars who are developing Central American scholars in these three areas, including Pablo Lopez Oro, Florida Malbosch Lopez, and Giovanni Batz. The third will and final meeting will be a debrief and a reflection that invites attendees to discuss the previous sessions. Um, and if you have um, any questions or want to contact us, our um, email is YaleCASWG at gmail.com. Um, and thank you so much. We especially encourage people in the East Coast to stay in touch with us. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry, the recording. Um, yes, we will make a recording available. We're still figuring out logistics on how to upload it and everything, but we want to have it available maybe um, by this weekend so people can who missed this session can watch it before the next session. So look out for that recording in your emails. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Maritza. Thank you, Suyapa. No, thank you for having us. Thank you, invitation. thank you so much for your questions, everyone, and for your time. I look forward to the next one. Same.